Um, we are in week seven. Like, we, for a month and a half, <laughs> we've been in this series called... Come on, we've been in a series called... Pastor Martin's message last week provoked so much thought that today um, I've, I've not been able to get rest in the past seven days. And it's starting to become like a regular thing. You ever get so excited for something that you can't find rest? Like you found peace because you found new information, but like you can't sleep because you're trying to figure out like somebody else needs to hear this. Like I got to figure out a way to like reproduce this so that somebody that I know can be just as free as I am. Because my biggest thing is like, I love living around people that are just as free as I am. Any person that didn't say amen to that is demonic. If you are okay, if you are okay, I told y'all I was coming. If you are okay with people living in bondage around you, that's a problem with I want everybody around me to be free. Anybody else? I want every, the dog to be free, the fleas on the dog to be free, the viruses in the fleas on the dog to be free, the bacteria in the viruses on the fleas on the dog. In my, like, if you walk in my house, like, you automatically become free because this atmosphere is so thick. Bondage doesn't live around me. And if you are bound, I give you permission to be free this morning. So this morning, it's going to be a little bit rough. Can you say rough? It's going to be a little bit tough, but I, I, want, I want you to lean into today. Because if you didn't like me after today, you're going to hate me. If, if you didn't, if you, if, you, if you had a problem with who I am yesterday, you, you, you. You're going to have a problem. You're going to have a problem because today is going to provoke who you are and who you think you are. And I can't teach you anything that God didn't put me through. That's like the beautiful thing about revelation, Jason. It's like God says, oh, so God, I want to teach people about being a forgiving person. God's like, are you sure? Because you remember those seven people that you got on that? You know those seven people that you wrote their name down and you blocked them on Instagram and Facebook, those people? How about we take you through a, a forgiveness boot camp before you teach it? Oh, you want to be free from sexual sin? Okay, how about no more booty calls at 3 o'clock in the morning? Whoa, Lord, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm coming! You ever got financial advice from somebody that was broke? Because somebody say, take several seats. Se several. We have many seats for you, for you to take. I want to start this sermon out uh, with a story. Can I tell you a story? Okay, so um, I... And thank you guys. Wasn't worship like stupid crazy this morning? Absolutely awesome. Oh, and I promised him. I, I got to do something. Can we do something really quick? So I found out today that a guy by the name of, his name is Levi Kirkman. Do you guys know who that is? That's uh, Mr. Matt and Miss Christine's, uh, Christina's son. And I need us to like go absolutely nuts because he did something pretty crazy this week. He made like four goals in the YMCA league and they couldn't touch him. Can we rejoice for that? Oh, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> I told you I was going to embarrass you. Okay, let's get into the word. We have fun here at Ambassadors Worship Center. There's nothing that's too small for us to celebrate. Your baby ate ice cream yesterday and didn't spill none. Oh, my God. Yeah, let's do it. Jenna just had a baby, and let's say he slept all the way through the night. God, thank you. Howard slept. Yes. Your car actually got the miles per gallon it's supposed to. God, thank you for that extra five miles. Anybody ever struggled before? All my college students. How much would you like to put on pump 12? $2. Are you serious? Oh, yes. <laughs> $2. And I got it in quarters and nickels. Anybody ready for the word? Are you ready for the word? Are you ready for the word? Let's have fun this morning. So uh, I, I, I do this thing where I try to like dive as deep into subjects that I don't know about because it exposes my ignorance. Like... If I don't know something, I get extremely excited. But it seems like in the church, a lot of us, as soon as a part of us that is ignorant, light gets shined on it, we dig it, and we dig a hole, and we bury it. And then our ignorance, it grows in that space, and it breeds, like, more ignorance. But I, I, I was trying to figure out, okay, God, we're in this series called Made. What's the next sermon supposed to be? Because it's kind of hard to teach the same subject for seven weeks, but we're going to do it today. Amen? Okay, here we go. So I got a story. 
So how many of you guys like salmon? Oy. That's crazy. More people like salmon than they like young adults. That's crazy. I'm kidding. 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 So I'm, like, you know, like with new innovations in science or new innovations in health, as soon as it comes out like on the news that chocolate is now the new antioxidant, what does everybody do? We go in to buy some chocolate. It happened in uh, 2013. Um, National Geographic did this study, this, this discovery I was watching um, on Tuesday, and they were trying to figure out how do we get salmon from the North Atlantic, which is the northeast side of the United States, how do we get it for all of our amazing vegans and pescatarians on the west side, which is California. And if you've ever been to California, they make the meanest sushi ever, right? And they use salmon. So they were trying to figure out, okay, so how do we get this salmon from one place to the other? So they decided to ship it. Can you say ship it? So they put the fish in, they, 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 they sealed it, like they, they vacuum sealed it, and they, they, they put it in these trucks, and the trucks were cooled by air conditioning, right? And the trucks went from east to west, and when they got to California, like they weren't as pink as they were before. Like they, they tasted different, like they were gamey, and it wasn't the same texture, right? Like you ever bought meat or fish that was like the, uh, the manager's special? It's like, oh, it's only $2. No, it went spoiled two days ago, boo-boo. <laughs> That's how it tasted. So the manufacturers were like, okay, we got this issue, so what do we do? So then what they did is they took those same fish, they took them out of the package and they put them on ice. Can you say on ice? And they shipped them on ice and they got there. And th what they found out was that the, the coolness of the temperature kept the fish pink, but they still tasted freezer burned. So it's a problem. So like we got the fish from where we want point A to point B, but they weren't there, right? It didn't work out. So they're like, okay, so, so we're losing money. Like, we're, we're losing money. How do we get these fish over there? It's so like, all right, we're going to keep them alive. We're going to keep them alive. We're going to put them in these tanks. We're going to put them on trains, cars, planes, and get them over there. The fish made it. Did they made it? They were alive. Like, they were breathing, and gills, but they didn't grow. And they still tasted disgusting. So they're trying to figure out, like, what... We're losing money, number one, because these fish are dying. But number two, nobody's buying this fish because it's nasty. So then, Miss Michelle, the reason why I have really nice teeth is because I'm... Um, they said, okay, so what are we going to do? So they said, well, what's the natural predator of the salmon? They said, so what, what, what could we put in this water that would keep it active? So they went and found the apex predator of the salmon. Everything in your life that you think is too scary... There's something bigger that can eat it up. And the only two options for that apex predator are Jesus Christ and who else? Just, just, just stop trying to filter and just be there. Like, I see somebody like, Rain Man. No, just be there. Look at your neighbor and say, just get it. So they put the catfish in the tank. And when the salmon got to California, they tasted better. They were bright red pink and also they had reproduced because what the scientists found out at this firm and figured out is that the only way that we can get these salmon to taste good, look good, feel good and reproduce is if we put something in the water that makes it keep swimming. So the executive basically said, if you want these salmon to produce at the level that you want them to, we got to give them a necessary enemy in their tank. So that's why you can have people that are, have a fresh life. They're alive, but their life is dead. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet if you have no enemies. Stand to your feet. Go ahead, brother. No, brother, you okay. Come on. Don't be afraid. Look at them say, don't be scared. Don't, don't be scared. If you have no enemies, no enemies, no, really, stand to your feet. Okay. There are some people standing. Look at me. Don't look around. Everybody's like, Ugh. I want you to say this. You, you ain't doing enough. If your life does not have life in it, maybe you're not doing anything big enough for something to try to stop. They don't want it today. They don't. So I'm going to do my best, and um, we're, we're going to figure it out. What they found out, if you ship the salmon with catfish in the tank, they test fresh, and they grew 
all at the same time because they were running for their lives in the tank. So that means that if you have an enemy in your life, if you can't find rest and you can't find peace, that means that growth is a part of your equation. If everywhere... If everywhere you turn, somebody don't like you, somebody Facebooking about you, somebody Instagramming about you, your neck is hot because somebody breathing down your neck, I want to make sure that you know that growth is in the process of that. Let me prove it to you through scripture because I know all the Bible scholars, Miss Teresa, are like, there's no Bible for that. Oh, but there is. But there is. I want you to go to John 10 and 10, New King James Version. It says, the thief or the enemy does not come except to do what? Steal kill and to destroy. Uh, But Jesus says, but I have come that you may have life and have that what? More abundantly. What I want to make sure that you understand is that the enemies in your life only come to do three things. I need you to write these down. They come to steal, kill, and destroy. They come to steal your time. They come to kill your opportunity, and they come to destroy your witness or your influence in the world. They steal your time, they kill your opportunity, and they destroy your witness or your influence. And I'm going to explain this a little bit more at the end of my sermon. So what are the three things that bring enemies? Like, ask a neighbor next to you. Like, like what, what, ask them. Like, what three things is it about me that would cause somebody, something to try to attack me? There's three things. It's your increase, your progression, or your distinction. Your increase speaks to that there are more eyes on you and there's an increase of people using you, consulting you and reaching out to you because who you are is expanding. Come on, in the spirit realm, just say, I'm expanding. Just get the end of the sermon now, like, I'm expanding. Like, my weight, I'm getting stocky. When I step on the concrete, it cracks how big I am. Like, that's what you have to understand. The minute that you grow, somebody sees it and they don't always like it. The second thing is progression. If you ever start moving forward or making ground or actually reaching your goals, how many of you guys know that people will cheer you on in the process, but they'll try to beat you up once they see your finish line? Because we live in a world where if I get to the finish line before you, you could feel some type of way about me and vice versa. It's all fun and games until I believe that somebody's winning over me. The third thing that happens where enemies come from is distinction. Say distinction. It's when you become set apart and get noticed or seen. Or listen to this, if you are different than when you started. The enemy comes and tries to steal the joy out of your heart at your highest point of happiness. That's why you can have Thanksgiving, Christmas dinner, and it's an amazing time. But if one person, that one uncle, everybody got him, right? That one, everybody got him? Everybody got him. Uncle Ruru, Uncle Jerome, Ron Ron, whatever his name is. As soon as he opens up his mouth... What used to be a festive time is now everybody going at one another. You want to see who your friends are? Start changing around them. And pay specific attention to who's clapping for you when it's time to give you an applause. I don't care about the people clapping for me because we've already had the conversation. They knew what was happening before we did the ordination. You know who I was watching? Those that were standing like this. I'm coming! This is the last day that we just sit in church and leave this place and be the same person. Can we be different today? Start to change and see who's in your corner. Start to change and see and see who has that. Remember that extra sandwich you needed for your baby because you didn't have no money? Start doing better than that person and see if they're there to help you build. You buy the new house and you invite them over for a housewarming and all they're doing is trying to look in every single room because they're not celebrating. They're just trying to see how much more do I have to grow to be better than you? Can we talk? Can we talk? So here it is. Here it is, here it is, here it is. One reason for no enemies is if you haven't increased, progressed, if you haven't changed at all. So if life is, if life is, look at your neighbor and say, if life is easy, easy. you ain't doing enough. The threat is is, is locking into the purpose God has designed specifically for you. That's the problem. Once you hear this news and you become different in your mind, now you become a threat. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a threat. So I get them all the time. Last year was one of the most difficult years of our life. Not just me and my family, but those of us that walked through this thing. Right, Kylan? Right, Ella Butler? Catelyn? It was tough. It was tough. 
People literally spit in your face and say things about you, and you got to stand there and hold your peace. So what I do is, you all know what I do? On Facebook and Instagram, I, I keep this folder of all the negative messages that I've ever received. I keep them because for every message that I get, it reminds me of what God told me before I started. Those messages, those people that are sending you the text messages and trying to lie on you to after today, you're not going to see them as a problem. You're going to see them as an opportunity like, wait a minute, I just gained a new enemy. So that means that he's trying to keep, they trying to, they trying to keep me from something that God wants for me. So in that sense, my enemy is necessary. I almost start. I'm in this place now where I'm looking for opposition. I need somebody to fight me because fight me. You're going to have to see me out here because that means that God has something bigger than you. And you got to teach me something before I get it. All of your enemies are your teachers. So there's a difference between enemies and friends. Your friends try to protect you from things. Your, your friends try to make sure everything is cool with you. They try to make sure that you don't have to deal with any frustration, any problems, and even if that means keeping you away from your purpose. But they're friends. I have this really great idea for this business. Well, you tried it three other times. You know what, David? I don't think that you should do this. They're a friend. They care for you. But the way in which they're speaking to you is keeping you from purpose. Enemies are necessary because they don't care about what they have to take you through. They're going to make sure you, that you develop. That's why some of your friends, they can be great when you need to be encouraged. They are great when you need to be built up. But you need some people that don't care about your life so that they can keep you running. Because as, as you're sedentary, sitting down, you're not building. You need some people behind you that are trying to get you so it keeps you motivated to move forward. Friends cover. Enemies call out. Friends protect your strengths and enemies do their best to expose your weaknesses. Friends lift you up in prayer and enemies try to strip you down of your belief and your faith. So this morning, if your faith is under attack, if your belief system is under attack, if your truth, if your identity is under attack, I just want to make sure that you, under, that you know and understand that you're in great company. Anytime somebody tries to come at you and say something, talk to you outside of your name, talk to you outside of their neck, try to talk blasphemous about you, today you're not going to talk to them. You're going to look straight up and be like, okay, what's coming? So here's my title. You ready for my title? You ready for my title? You sure? My title today is Protect Your Judas, The Necessity of an Enemy. The other subtitle that you could use is Protecting My Judas. Dealing with ungodly, difficult people God's way. If we understand that we're like God, we have to understand for all of the hundreds of thousands of people that we set free, there are hundreds of thousands of them that want to crucify us. Jesus is the perfect example because he had the same love for the person who betrayed him as he did for the person that followed him. Our problem in the church is that we make a list of those folks and we hate them for hating us. But the problem is, is that they're living free and we're living bound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo! For every person that I carry that I can't forgive, even if they've done me wrong, I carry the weight of that person. So we have a lot of people in church that are carrying a lot of weight and a lot of stress and they're asking God to relive it, I mean, to, to relieve them of it. And God's saying, no, you're carrying that person with you. Somebody say, protect my Judas. Amen. Write this down. The proof of relationships is in evolution. If you have been in a relationship for a long period of time and nothing has changed, the relationship is dead. If you're in relationships with people that are not as smart or not smarter than you, that they don't push you when you're with them, you never feel uncomfortability, you probably need to find some new folks. Because unmoved people never move. And the minute that you move, it's either too fast or too slow. So they'll stop your progress to make them feel comfortable. All right, let's get into it. So Jesus and Judas, have you ever wondered how an all-knowing God allowed his enemy to be so close to him? Think about it. How did Jesus himself knew that, Judas, you're going to betray me, and because of your betrayal, they're going to come and crucify me? The all-knowing God, merciful Jesus, how, how could he allow his enemy to be so close to him? Have you ever wondered that? His enemies were close to him, and it, he, he never frees us from ours. Have you ever realized that? Anytime you want an enemy really out of your life, God gives you the power to remove them yourself. 
Look at it. The, the, the children of Israel, right? The children of Israel. Um, they, they wanted the people, they, they wanted, they wanted the, uh, uh, um, when, they, when they looked into Jericho, they saw giants, right? They saw giants. And they were like, yo, like Caleb and Josh came back. They're like, listen, they big, they hairy, and they scary. I, I don't know what we're supposed to do, but God said it's our land, so we're supposed to do something with it. Sometimes your enemy will occupy a space that God is preparing you for. Because if you had it right now, you wouldn't know what to do with it. So some people need to sit in that job that you think you should have got. Some people got to get the promotion before you do so they can set the stage for you. Like, who am I talking to? Like, they got to get the job and mess it up so bad. Oh! Oh! She got to be in a relationship with dude doesn't take care of her emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So that when you step up on the scene, you're like fresh water. Who am I talking to? A lot of times the enemy occupies your space so that the space is fulfilled. So they are placement holders for your blessing. So now when, I, when you start to see enemies in places where you think you're supposed to be, don't be frustrated because they were placed there to set the stage for you. Okay, here we go. Jesus broke bread with Judas. He protected him. He never said, Peter, hey, look, when I blink, you're going to have two seconds to fold my hands up. Never said it. He protected Judas against the other 11 disciples. Do not touch my anointed. What are you talking about? He's a snake. Don't touch him. He included Judas in his life transitions. Everywhere that he went, Judas was at his right side. It's going to be so good for you in a second. He also trusted him. Did you know that Judas out of the 12 was the best with money? You trust wicked people with your money every single day. It's called the bank. It's different. He, he, he told the Messiah he was going to die. No, 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 no. When you go to the bank, try to go get all your money out today. Try I want to take all $25,000 out. Oh, that's cute. It's actually not here. We've actually loaned it against your interest at 25%. So, so, so Jesus has a crook next to him, but he still loves him. Today, I'm going to destroy the Holy Spirit. I'm not taking, I'm not claiming, I got you. The Holy Spirit is going to destroy your thoughts of thinking that you can treat people how you want to and still call yourself a Christian. Somebody say, leave my Judas alone. So when we look at the Bible, right, in John, the title that we're going to talk about today, we're going to go to John 13, 21 through 30. But the title in the Bible is this. It says, the one who ate bread at my table. The one who ate bread at what? My table. Which means that Jesus specifically put Judas at the table. Here we go. First John. I mean, John 13, 21 through 30. I'm not including all of you in this. At this point in time, Jesus is sitting at the Last Supper and he's sitting with his 12 disciples and he's starting to tell them what's gonna happen. Like, this is how it's gonna happen. He tells Peter, remember pastor taught that message at Shake the Nations? If you haven't got it, he talks about the necessity of Peter and how I ain't gonna ruin it. Pops, you gotta teach that joint. It like, wouldn't that be awesome if we did a series on like why each disciple was important to Jesus? Because each one of them, you need at least 12 people in your life that know you better than you. Anyway, so he's sitting at the table with the the disciples. He's trying to figure it out. I mean, he's he's telling them, like, I'm going to die. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. I'm going to build my church with you. I'm going to give you my mother. I'm going to give you my name, blah, 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 blah. But he says this. I'm not including all of you in this. I know precisely whom I've selected. Underline that. Who selected? He selected. So as not to interfere with the fulfillment of the scripture, the one who ate bread at my table turned on his heel against me. The one who's going to betray me, I put them there. We overread this as Jesus is saying, whoever I pass this bread to, God is going to give me this unknowing doubt that this is the person. No, no, no. Jesus said, whoever I give this bread to is going to betray me. A lot of the times when your heart has been broken, you have self-served it to that individual. Please break my heart. Okay, let's, let's move on. They're getting quiet, Kylan. After he said these things, Jesus became visibly upset. And then he told them why. He said, one of you is going to do what? Betray me. The disciples looked around at one another, wondering who on earth he was talking about. 
But listen to this and underline it. One of the disciples who, the one Jesus loved dearly, who was what? Reclining against him. His head on his shoulder. Peter motioned to him, the guy that's sitting next to Jesus with his head on his shoulder. And he says what? He says, he says to ask who Jesus might be talking about. So being the closest, he said, master who? Sometimes your enemy isn't the person sitting across the table, but it's the person closest to you. Because the closer I get to you and the more trust you have with me, I know your every move and I can create a plan to counteract what you're building. Jesus says this. He says, Jesus said, the one to whom I give this crust of bread after I've dipped it. Then he dipped the crust and gave it to who? But where was Judas sitting? Right next to him. Peter asked the man sitting next to, ne next to Jesus, the man who's leaned on him, putting all of his weight on him as acting as he is trusting in Jesus. Who is the person? And he hands him the bread. Is this good to anybody? So he gave the crust to Judas, son of uh, Simon of Iscariot. As soon as the bread was in his hand, what happened? Satan did what? Entered him. The enemy is looking for an opportunity to find a gap in your confidence. Like it's not this oogie boogie devil that we don't have power over. No, we have power. I can walk into a situation. I can get stricken with sickness and look at myself and be like, you are healed. Anybody ever done it? You... You are healed. You can walk into your house and say, you got to get this together. You don't need nobody to come and pray. You don't need no holy oil. You by yourself are enough to walk into your situation and plead the blood of Jesus. Somebody say amen so I can move on. You are powerful beyond measure. That's why God calls you God's little G. How can we say that we're created just like God and we're in his image and we're sons and daughters, but we bastardize ourselves by calling ourselves something other than what he is? If a cow has a cow, you don't call it a kitten. You call it a calf. But on the inside of that calf is what? A cow. So if God gave birth to you and he is a God, that means that you are what? You are just like your daddy. Stop thinking the opposite. That means when you walk into a situation, sickness has to go if you don't want it there. Your family going crazy and you don't like it, just walk into the situation and stay like, man up. You got to go. This is unfamiliar. I'm not supposed to have to go to certain places with my kids at the zoo and they can't go to all the exhibits because we ain't got the bread. No, I'm supposed to be to walk into anything with my kids and they can touch anything. Even if they break it, I got the bread to take care of it because my God supplies more than enough. And if my God supplies more than enough, I should be able to as well. If my God walks in confidence, dad blasted, I am too. And if you think I'm cocky, that's great because I need more enemies. If you don't have nobody to hate on, feel free to hate on me because I need God to get me to where I need to go. And sometimes the only signal that I need that it's time to go isn't a green light. It's somebody else trying to spew venom on me. I welcome them. Please hate on me because it shows how silly you are and how great he is. Woo! Oh, Jesus said, the one who I give the crust to, he gives the crust to Judas. Simon is on the other side, right? Uh, uh, Peter is like, bro, I'm about to strap dude up. Jesus says, chill out. He's sitting here on purpose. You don't think I would have sat this person next to me? I'm God. I got it. So what must you do? Said Jesus. What does he say? Do it and get it over with. In the Amplified, it says, Judas, you know, what, you know what your assignment is, so do it quickly. Jesus so gangster, like, Jesus so bad, like, he said, you know what, you're going to kill me, here's the gun, but I'm going to come back on the third day and I'm going to free all of humanity. So I need you to hate on me because you're the initial push that I need to know that God is with me. What the enemy wants you to understand and wants you to believe is that the minute that any type of obstacle or enemy comes in your life, he wants you to run. But what you have to understand is that video games, they progress when you run towards the enemy. I don't know any movies, I don't know any wars, I don't know any video games, any fighting games where you are progressing if you don't fight a new enemy. 
Like once you kill everything on level one, there's nothing else to fight, but you can't level up until you go to what? Level two. So if you're dealing with a new enemy in your life, that means you're on a totally different level. Because what thought it could, what, woo, what thought it could kill you on level one is now your footstool and a trophy to be able to say, look what I made it through. Anybody got some trophies? Oh, he thought we were going to get divorced, but we're a happily married couple. Look at this trophy I got. The devil thought the cancer was going to take me out, but look at this trophy. You see this cancer trophy right here? Because I beat that. You need to start wearing what you went through. Not that what you went through made you who you are, but God has made you resilient. The thought of saying to turn the other cheek isn't to give the opportunity for somebody to hit you again. No, no, no. It's to give the opportunity to show I'm so bad that I got four cheeks for you to hit because it's just letting me know that there's something bigger that God wants me to do. Somebody say four cheeks. I think that's a sermon. Let me write that down. That's a sermon. Say I won't. Say I won't turn into a sermon. Say I won't. I need 10 people to say I won't, so I will. I need 10 people. Say I won't. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Four cheeks pops is coming. No one around the supper table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that since Judas was their treasurer, that Jesus was telling him to buy what they needed for the feast. Do what you need to do. Do it quickly. Or that Jesus should, I'm, I'm sorry, or that Judas should give something to the poor. But look at verse 30. What does it say? Judas with the piece of bread did what? Left into what? Into the night. He didn't question it. He didn't say, no, Jesus is not me. When somebody shows you who they are the first time. Sweetheart, he didn't pay for your dinner, hold the door open and all that other stuff. The first date, this is who he is. He didn't shake your father's hand, didn't think that he needed to ask him for your hand. And, you hired the person and they never thought that it was important to let you know about what's going on in their life. Your employee has let you know. Your child ran into school and ran a mess and lied to you. They have now told you, dad, you probably shouldn't trust me on this one. When somebody shows you who they are, you shouldn't question it. Rather, you should say, thank you for being so honest that you are willing to show me the terrible side of who you are to save me some time. But what we do is we recycle bad people and get upset when they hurt our feelings. Come on, let's talk. So Judas could have got to the point where he betrays Jesus. And if Jesus didn't believe what he saw, he'd be like, oh my God, Judas, you've broken my heart. And it would have given Judas power. But later on, what we see is that Judas goes, right, and he betrays Jesus and Jesus doesn't even look at him. Jesus in his heart says that the grace that I'm about to die for is sufficient for you too, even though you betrayed me. What if in the situations where you were justified to five finger somebody in the face, you know, what if instead of doing that, you looked at them and said, the grace that God is going to give me and the blessing because of your betrayal is going to bless you too. How much would that mess somebody up? They throw a rock at you and you throw a hundred dollar bill at them. Everything that touches me turns to gold. So it actually profits you better to hate me. Oh, Jesus. So can we go to the message? Can we go to the message Bible? Listen to this. So the disciples were stunned, and then they began to ask one another, it isn't me, is it, Master? It ain't me. Is it me? If you got to ask if it's you, it's not you. But if you ask distinguishing questions to people around you and they have nothing to say, How many of y'all got, got kids? Who broke the cookie jar? You got four kids. Three of them are, man, I don't know. Somebody walked in the kitchen. The other one, like, I didn't eat the Cheetos. Cheetos all over them, right? They, like, figure it out. But the one child that's quiet. <laughs> they try to creep out of the room. You got to watch out for the one that's unfamiliar. Everybody's clapping and one person isn't. Wait a minute. I thought you were my friend. You just got into a new relationship. Dude is everything. Like he's the man that you ask God for. He checks off everything on the list, but all your girlfriends don't like him except for one. 
the one that's supposed to be your best friend. I don't know if he's it for you. Wait a minute, but you prayed for me when, before he came, and now he's here, and now you hating? Oh, that means he might be the one. I need you close so that you can be like a barking dog that lets me know when trouble's coming, because it's not trouble, it's opportunity. In the South, dogs chase after cars just for the heck of it. But have you ever asked, like, what would you do if you caught the car? Instead, what those dogs are doing for people that live, because they have long country roads, the dogs start barking to let you know that you got company. So when wicked people in your life start barking, lying about you, telling things about you, trying to slander your name, all they're letting you know is that there's something coming up your driveway. And its name is opportunity. Come on. Its name is blessing. Its name is provision. So I need some guard dogs so that when that thing comes, I just hear everybody barking. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. But if you ain't got no people hating on you, that means you ain't got nothing worth coming up your driveway. Say my enemy is necessary. Shove your neighbor. Say wake up. I'm talking about you. So Jesus answered, he said, the one who hands me over is someone I eat with how, how often? Daily. One who passes me food at the table. Sometimes the person that will betray you will be the person that is handing, giving you life. Bread gives you sustenance. Bread gives you life. It gives you energy. Sometimes the person who is in your life that's giving you everything that you think you need is doing it just so that they can say that they're the one giving it to you. That conversation sounds like this. Don't forget what I did for you. Don't, don't forget. You might make it in the movie industry, but don't forget what I did for you. It's because I'm blessing you, not because I see the potential in you. I'm blessing you because my talents, I don't have what I need, so I need to sink my claws into what God is giving you so I can be along for the ride. A lot of your relationships aren't people that really want to be close to you. They're leeches. go to the word. Let's go to the word. 2324, Jesus answered, the one who hands me over is someone that I eat with daily, one who passes me food at the table. In one sense, the son of man is entering into a way of treachery well marked by the scriptures. No surprises here. Jesus says, what's going to happen? I'm making it happen. I'm not surprised. I'm God. In another sense, that man who turns me in turns traitor to the son of man. The person who is your enemy is no longer your enemy. They're God's enemy. Listen, if you are frustrated with me, you're not frustrated with me because everything I got came from G-O-D. That was so hard. You see how that rhymed? If you ain't upset, you ain't upset with me because everything that I got came from G-O-D. Sign me. I'm here. I'm here, bro. I'm here. Your enemy doesn't see that what you have, you're not connected to. God is giving it to you. When you open up your mouth, God uses your mouth as a window, as a door to speak what he wants on earth from heaven through you. So people will see you and be like, man, what you got on your life, I need it. But the thing about the kingdom, the thing about finding salvation is that everything that I have, guess what? It's available to who? You. So what's the point in hating me over something that's for me when God has something open for you? If you would stop looking at me and being jealous, if you would stop looking at that person and being frustrated with their life and turn towards what God has for you, you would realize that God has more over for you than what you could steal from that person. Look at your neighbor and say, what's for me? It's for me. Which means that you literally can't steal the blessing on my life. So you can try, but you can't because it's got my seal on it. There are some things in heaven that got your seal on it. And God's like, well, stop worrying about what they got and get what I got for you. Because if you got my stuff, it's counterfeit because it has a giant JW on it. And when you take it to redeem it at the clerk's office, they're going to be like, this isn't for you. That's why some people can steal things from you that you thought were a great opportunity. And they are actually being terrorized in something you thought you were supposed to be blessed in. That job opportunity that you think you wanted and now you see, though, that was a lot of work. I don't want it. That girl that you were really interested in but your best friend stole her from you, been there before, and now they're in, and now they're living in hell and trying to figure it out. Not trying to say that's what God wanted for their life, but God, thank you so much for sending my enemy that tried to steal something that wasn't for me in the first place. 
You thought you were supposed to be at work 15 minutes early, but you took a shower and then ate an extra hard-boiled egg, and that put you five minutes later on the road. And as you're driving towards work, you see a giant crash, and you're like, oh, that's no big deal. No, 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 no. If you wouldn't have eaten that hard-boiled egg. The enemy had a snare to catch you, but because God gave you the anointing to eat more protein. Well, the egg saved my life. I just knew I needed to eat another egg. No, God woke you up five minutes later because he knew that there was an assignment. There was a hit out on you to take you out. So what else has God disguised as a failure so that you wouldn't praise it? What? What? What else has God disguised as a problem so you wouldn't look at it saying that it blessed you? Anybody ever seen a car crash that had your name on it? Anybody ever seen a relationship? Like if I would have hooked up with that person, Lord have mercy. So instead of worshiping the relationship, you could look at God and be like, yo, somebody go like I died. Any business owners, you almost took, Somebody came to you with the exact amount of money you needed for your investment to get your business off the ground. But something in your stomach said, this, this ain't the right money. Their hands seem a little bloody. All money is not good money. All opportunities are not good opportunities. All favor is not good favor. Every person that says they have something good for you ain't good. Let me, I'm starting to turn into dad. Let me. <laughs> Let me get back up here. Then Jesus already turned traitor. Listen, the word. This is the word, so you can't come at me. Judas already turned traitor said, it isn't me, is it, Rabbi? He didn't even have the decency to call Jesus Lord. Anytime you look at Judas talking to Jesus, he only calls him Rabbi. He never calls him God, Jehovah, Son of Man, Yeshua. The only thing he calls him is rabbi, pastor, leader. He never calls him the son of God. I want to make sure that you understand that your enemy can't call you by your first name because they know that your first name comes with power. And if I'm going to try and backstab you, I can't call you who you are because if I call you who you are, it reaffirms the name that God gave you. Which means if your mama named you Joseph... There is power in that name because she named you that when she named you. So when you gave your heart to Christ and you received salvation, in the New Testament, it says that you got a new name. That name is freedom. That name is opportunity. That name is healing. And the enemy can't call you by your first name because they know if I call him by his first name, it's going to call him back to remembrance of who he is. So let me call Jesus rabbi because it's not that big of a deal. That's why your boss can't call you by your first name. They call you Bud, Tiger, employee, my staff. No, 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 no. I work here at the church, right? And there are some people that I work alongside with. They don't work for me. I can't deny you of your name because if God called you to this place, that means that you have equal power as I do. I refuse to work in a place where the person that runs it thinks that they're more powerful than I am just because they own it. That's how this church has been here for 25 years because our pastors were not afraid to get on hand and knee and scrub the toilets with a toothbrush. Who am I talking about? Pastors weren't afraid to write a $10,000 check to get somebody out of debt even though our family was about to file for bankruptcy the next week because they understood something. God, if you put me in this space, there's some stuff that I got to sacrifice to get to where I'm going. But if you have no enemy, if you have no reason to sacrifice anything, you got nothing to live for. You need something behind you, pushing you towards what God called you to. So I got some points. You ready? Let's do it. The first point, your enemy is your catalyst. Kylan used to teach this thing to us for years. It got so annoying because he said, your catalyst, your catalyst, your catalyst. God can't do what he needs to do in the earth until you're dropped in it. But it's the truth. You ever dropped a Mentos into Coca-Cola? The potential for the Coca-Cola to blow up is in it, but it needs the Mentos to be dropped in it for it to actually happen. You need to understand that for some situations that you're going through, the enemy is necessary so that it will literally kick you off the ledge. Because true friends that really love you don't want to see you get hurt, and they're not going to kick you into the opportunity. 
But the crazy thing about the enemy is that it kicks you into the opportunity thinking that you're going to fall on your face. Like, oh, they ain't going to do it. Push them. And what they don't understand is because you pushed me, you've just started a domino effect that God had planned for me in the beginning. Your enemy identifies the next level and it signals that what is coming is near to you. The minute somebody starts talking about you, the minute somebody says, you ain't made for it, oh, that means I am. You ugly beyond measure. That means that whoever's looking for me is looking for my features because it's what they want. You ain't got the money. Oh, that means that the money's coming. Thank you. Point number two. Enemies confirm what God is doing. You trying to figure out if God is speaking to you? Run in the direction of most resistance. Not least resistance. Don't run against it. Don't, don't run with the wind at your back so you can run faster. No, 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 no. Face the wind and try to see what's past it to open your eyes and take the brunt of it to see what God's doing. Is that good? Number three, your enemy knows who you are. Listen to this. The one who is closest to you knows who you are. But you have the power to choose how the story goes. Caleb, can you come and set up the table for me real quick? Let's look at verse 22 and 25. The disciples looked around at one another, wondering who on earth he was talking about. One of the disciples, the one Jesus loved dearly, was doing what? Reclining against him, his head on his shoulder. Your enemy knows who you are. This is what it means. It means that your enemy is so close to you that they know what you smell like. Your enemy can be so close to you, people that you think are with you, things that you think are with you, situations that you think are for you, they know what your face looks like when you get excited. Anybody ever like bought a house or bought a car? What's one one of the the, the biggest pieces of advice that I've been given when, uh, when buying a house or buying a car or buying something that you want is to not let the seller know that you're really interested. Why? Because it gives them incentive to basically throw the rule book at you. Some of the people that are your enemies are close to you so that they can know what you get excited about. So it's very important who you share your dreams with. Man, God was just showing me. And they're like, oh, yeah? Yeah. When? With who? Mm -hmm. What time? How much is it going to cost? Okay. So maybe I should plan for us to go on a three-day vacation to Vegas. So the money you were going to use to invest, you just spend it on slot machines but I'm going to introduce it to you as an opportunity. Your enemy knows how to give you what you think you want. Who am I talking to? Give you what you think you want and wrap it up in an opportunity to make you think like it's what you need. Jesus. Number four, say know who's at your table. Write this down. You need to prepare for who is coming to dinner. God gives you something amazing. He gives you something big that you're about to work on. You need to know who's coming to dinner. How many of you are married? You ever invited people over for dinner and your wife originally said, or your husband said originally four people were coming and then you got to the table and there were five place settings? Who, who's this fifth person? You need to start asking God, God, that you, I'm going to get there. This is the punchline. But you set a table before me in the midst of our enemies, but I need to know who, who's coming to dinner. So I know if I can eat peacefully or if I need to wait until everybody's eaten to see if the food is poison. Okay, I'll move on. I'll move on. You can't tell God about who you don't know. Somebody just comes into your life undetected and you're praying, God, I don't know where this heat coming from. It's just coming from my left and my right and my front and my back. No, no, no. Did you, who's been watching the gate of your relationships? Who's been watching who's coming in and out of your life? Because if you have deemed somebody close to you, God can't strip something away from you that you've accepted. Anybody got a girlfriend, boyfriend, she always go back to the same dude and you know she, he ain't it. She know he ain't it, but she's attached to him because she's accepted his foolishness. A lot of the stuff in our life, God will not take away because we have literally taken everything that we have and we've traded it in for our peace. We've traded it in for our joy because we're accepting the foolishness that comes with it. 
So God says, this enemy that you're dealing with, I can't give you strategy to kill something that you're feeding. You can't give instruction to angels about people you have no details about. There are some people in your life, you just say, God, Jonathan, that friend of mine, I need you to make a way out of no way. But you can't have your angels out here just slaughtering people. God, all my friends, kill them. Okay, whatever you say. No, that's not how it goes. Number five. Don't let your reaction disqualify you. God judges your reaction, not what happened to you. When somebody comes against you, when when something happens to you, God doesn't, I believe that God, I, I know for sure that God doesn't judge what happened to you because that's not what he's worried about. As a parent, you don't care that your, that your son or daughter was kicked down in the classroom. The first question you ask is, what did you do? It's not that I'm trying to say that what you did is bad. What I'm trying to say is I need to know the character and the morals and the values that we've been instilling in you in private. Did they come to play in public? So God wants to know. You were praying in your prayer closet. God, give me a spirit of discernment. God, give me a spirit of faith and mercy and grace. But something bad happens and they don't get grace. They get the wrath. Well, they came at me sideways. God doesn't say, man, that's terrible. They came at you sideways. God says, so what did you do? What was your reaction? Because you know better. I want to make sure you understand that when you come into this marvelous light that we call salvation, you now know better. Look at your neighbor. Say, you know better. You lying. Look at your other neighbor. Say, you know. You know better. The worst thing that you can do for your enemy is to retaliate towards them in the same manner that they attacked you. The best thing that you can give your enemy is retaliation. Can I prove it to you? Caleb, can you come? David, can you come? Come quick, come quick, come quick, come quick. I want to show you this. I want to show you this. David, I need you to sit right here. Caleb, I need you to sit there. Caleb is Peter. David is Jesus. I'm Judas. David writes in Psalms 25, 19 to 21. He says, consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. David writes this at the end of his life because he's about to die. So he's telling God, like, there are so many enemies that I've dealt with. If I'm a king and you gave, if God has called you to be king, you're going to have to have some enemies because there are some battles you have to fight. So there are some situations that you have to go through because you are king. You wear a crown. How can you be a king and not fight battles? Winning battles proves how mighty the God that you serve is. So if you're not fighting anything, that means that you're not protecting anything worth attacking. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Listen to this 21st verse. What does it say? Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. The proof of a weapon's effectiveness is in how you react to it. Let me say it again. The proof of a weapon and its effectiveness is not how it hurts you. It's how you react to it. That's why we can, uh, have you guys ever heard of Romans 14, 16? Romans 14, 16 says what? Do not let your good be spoken evil of. So let me show you this illustration. You like illustrations? You got dinner to get to? Okay, good. It's only gonna be like five more minutes. This is the last supper. This is dinner. That's Peter. This is Jesus. Peter would do anything and everything for Jesus. He cut a man's ear off, and Jesus said, he ain't the one. He was like, oh, my bad, player pimp, my bad. Like, you, no big deal. Shink, my bad, dog. Hey, no harm, no foul, but, you know, you will get folded up. Like, like, G, like Peter was so for Jesus that he was willing to put himself in harm's way. But who did Jesus sit right next to him? the person who nobody else trusted. Because Jesus knew when he told Peter that you're going to betray me, what did Peter do? He denied it. But when Jesus gave Judas the piece of bread, he didn't just not deny it, he took it and ran with it. Jesus tells Peter, you're gonna gonna betray me. Peter like the homie on the set. On phone him, I ain't going to do it, God. What you mean? I ain't going to betray you, man. This is on crib cut. Not, not really. Not really. Not really. Not really. Like bloods. Like the blood of Jesus that saves and sanctifies. Not, whew, you never know who's in here. 
I'm phoning him, God. I ain't going to do that. What you mean, man? I've been with you. I've been rocking with you. You called me the rock, which is Simon Peter. Like, why would I do that? But he tells Judas, you're going to betray me. And Judas doesn't just sit away from him. He gets closer. In your season of progression, you need to watch who's trying to get closer to you. Because nine times out of ten, the people that are trying to get closer to you, they don't really care about you. They care about what's on you, and they're trying to wear the clothes that God gave you. But this is the problem. What if Jesus would have punched Judas in the face? What if Jesus would have, like, reached across the table, like, you ain't going to kill me, what you mean you're going to kill me? No, no, no. What Jesus has just now done is told God, the plan that you gave me to get me to my next isn't good enough. And remember, we just talked about how Jesus doesn't look at what happened to you. He looks at how you react to it. This is the reason why when things happen to you in the workplace, the minute that you cut up and start cursing people out, people don't look at the person that did what they did to you. They look at you. Because now you're the one that looks crazy. You said you were a Christian? I thought you knew better. No, you got to realize something. The minute that you became a salvaged person, salvation, that God made you out of new parts, now you are literally Jesus in every single one of your situations. If Jesus would have came across the table and tried to kill him, everything that he would have taught his disciples about be graceful, turn the other cheek, it would have all went out the window. So what witness have you lost because you lost your mind in public? What influence have we lost as the church because we lost our mind in public? That young man, Botham, Botham, the one that was killed, it amazes me how many pastors put stuff on Instagram and Facebook condemning his brother for forgiving the lady in the courtroom. But I thought that we were Christians. I'm not talking to what she did. I'm not talking to racism. I'm not talking to socialism. But 14 billion people are watching this on television. If I... If I could be the catalyst to say, I pray that you find Jesus, what have I done? What the world wants you to get caught up with is that it's a black thing, it's a white thing, it's a money thing. No, this is a Jesus thing. Any opportunity where I am justified to act out of my mind, I get to make the decision of who's showing up to dinner. Look at your neighbor and say, protect your witness. Protect your witness. Don't allow your good to be evil spoken of. A lot of people want to be close to me, but we have meetings where they yell at me and say a whole bunch of things to me. No, your witness has just now been destroyed because you just showed me what your heart's intent is. The person that you need to be worried about the most is the one that doesn't say anything when stuff happens. We're supposed to be like yeast. We're supposed to be like salt, which means that when the right moment comes, then you'll know that I'm salty. He killed your brother in cold blood, shot him in the face. I know. And God is sufficient and grace is sufficient for that. But you need Jesus. What would happen in your life? What would happen in your life if somebody slapped you and the first thing you said, like, man, what is it about me that you trusted me to slap me? Because another person you would have slapped would have shot you. But you knew that I know a God that all you're doing when you do things to me is a cry for help. You start looking at your situations differently, that your enemies aren't trying to get something from you. They're trying to figure out who is this God that you serve. The word of God says that when you are nice to your enemies, it's like dumping hot coals on their head because they can't figure out, I hate you, but you keep, you keep. Like I was sent to this situation to try and kill you and you keep feeding me. You keep blessing me. You keep praying for me. That woman is only going to serve so many years in jail, right? And this judicial system is whack. And if you believe it, that's on you. But we need to read, church. We need to read, church. Watching the 7 o'clock, 10 o'clock news, if you're smart enough, you understand the only small percentage of what you're getting through television. You need to read. The judicial system is going to do what it does. What's of the world is of the world. But when that young man stood up and said, can I hug her? Who are we to judge that the Holy Spirit didn't? 
Because what they want the narrative to be is that another black man died and now we have to hate white people and white people need to think that all black people are savages. But what if in your situation, you stood up and you said, I'm not going to fight that and I'm not going to fight that, but I'm going to bring Jesus into every situation. I don't care if it's black, white, Muslim, Hindu, gay, lesbian, abortion clinic. I don't care what it is. Everything deserves the blood of Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah. Thank you. Everything deserves a hallelujah. Everything deserves the blood of Jesus. So we hate somebody so much that we can't believe that God is sufficient for them. Yes, what you did is terrible. You killed a man in cold blood. We don't know what happened because we weren't there. We can't be totally objective. But you know what I am objective about? You know what I am objective about? The same blood that saved me is good enough for every person. And if you don't believe that, you're in the wrong place. If you think the blood only washes some clothes and not the other ones, you need to go purchase a new detergent. Because this detergent at this house washes everybody clean. The detergent that flows from Ambassador's Worship Center, it doesn't care about what sin you have. If you've murdered somebody or stolen a cookie, God's grace is sufficient for all of it. Everything in between. When did we become so frustrated that we will wish spiteful things on our enemy? They don't hurt you because they don't like you. They hurt you because they don't like themselves. I don't like me enough, so let me try to strip down some progress because I ain't got it in my life. David writes this psalm. Listen up. Psalms 23. It says, the Lord is my... Listen to what he's writing. Remember... David, we love him, but he was a very sinful, wicked, like he dealt, he slept with another dude's wife, sent that man off to, to war, then sent his son to war, because like, if you don't kill the daddy, the son going to be like, you killed my pops, I'm coming to kill, no, we ain't doing that Simba joint, scarred and messed it up, he should have killed Simba, so I'm going to kill both of y'all. <laughs> his son violates his own sister. He sets, he sets kingdoms on fire. God says, don't take the spoils, and he takes everything for himself. But listen to what David says at the end of his life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to what? Lie down in green pastures. He what? Leadeth me beside the still waters. He what? Restoreth my health. A sinner is saying, God, you still love me. But we have people that are dirty in church and we criticize them for coming. It's like going to the gym and seeing somebody overweight and laughing at them because they're on the Stairmaster. What, what are we doing? What's the point of the gym for people not to get right? Why would we have a church of people that are sick, abused, dirty, trying to figure it out, and now they come into church, and we tell them they're too dirty for the love of God? Where do they do that at? I'd rather have an entire church of people that don't know him than people that are trying to keep those folks out of here. Oh, you dirty? Come on. You smell? Come on. Oh, you got blood on your hands? I got the blood that can clean that off. Come on. Oh, you're sick? HIV, AIDS, I ain't worried about it because I got a God that created healing. Oh, your family's messed up? Please come through. Come through. Somebody say come through. Anytime you see any injustice in this church where somebody is beating down another person, you should have to say something, not our pastor. You see a child being parented by somebody that's not their parent? Hold up, wait a minute. This is the son of God. This is not just some kid you saw in the hallway. You see any of our elderly at the grocery store trying to figure it out with their groceries? You are now responsible because you are a new person. Let me help you. Act of, random acts of kindness save people's lives every day. Verse 4. Is this good? Verse 4. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the what? I will what? Even though I'm walking through this situation and it's killing me, God, I'm not going to be fearful because why? Every enemy that comes to you, they might just see you, but they don't see the God that's behind you. When divorce tries to come into your family, they try to deal with you and your husband, but you need to introduce them. Oh, you think you're fighting this marriage. No, boo-boo. You're fighting that. Any students, you're fighting against a teacher that, oh, I, I forgot your grades. Excuse me? Oh, that paper, I'm sorry. What? You're going to have to take the class over. You need to stop trying to, like, advocate for your grades and allow them to meet King Jesus. I need this degree so I can make change in our community. So you're going to have to go find that paper. <laughs> 
Verse five, underline this because after today, you're gonna see this totally different. Thou does what? Prepares a table before me in the presence of mine, what? In the presence of your friends? In the presence of your family? In the presence of those people that are with you? In the presence of those that made the meal for you? No, no, no. God realizes something. What I'm about to do in your life, it needs an audience. What I'm about to do for you, through you, in your family, I need to sit Judas next to you so that he can see his entire purpose really didn't mean anything. All he was was a dog barking, letting you know something's coming. The table that God has prepared for you in the midst of your enemies isn't so that you can be vain and show out and be like, look what I got. No, 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 no. Your enemies are at your table so that you can show them the same God that blessed me. Can, will, and wants to bless you. God's with me. So no matter what you throw at me, it doesn't mean anything. Can I, can I, can I prove it to you? Can I prove it to you? I need you to stand to your feet. Send your feet, send your feet, send your feet. This is it. Y'all tired of the workout? If I would have put what we were working out on the board, y'all would have been, I ain't coming to the gym today. But you, you walked in the door, so it's time to get to work. Listen to this. So good. Number six, say protect your Judas. Protect your Judas. Judas is the sign of your purpose is time to shine. Him at the table wasn't a threat. It was a signal to Jesus that it's time to go. So we got to figure out how to treat our enemies. I want you to write these down. Number one, Proverbs 25, 21. God says, do what? Feed and water your enemy. Romans 12, 14. Jesus says what? Bless your prosecutor. As they pick up stones to throw at you, as they pick up stones to throw at you, you should be praying, God, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God, your grace is enough for them. Even though I'm getting hit with these rocks, these rocks are just showing me that I'm going in the right direction. And the third thing that we have to do is Matthew 5, which is to pray for your enemy. There are some of us in the room, you've been carrying some people in your back pocket since you were 12 years old. Little Billy rolls up on me at, the, at, at kindergarten on the play set and you, you, you self-declared somebody as your enemy. But what God wanted to make sure you knew is that when you got upset with little Billy beating you up on the schoolyard is because now God opened up that spirit of advocacy for people that can't protect themselves. You got beat up so that you could say, you know what, I'm gonna stand in the place of people that don't have the power to stand up for themselves. The one way that you bless God is by blessing those that have hurt you. But you wanna know a part of that, what you can do? Is you gotta let them go. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's message. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. If you are interested in not missing any other videos that we upload, make sure to click the subscribe button down below. Also, if this message has impacted you in such a way, you can also click the link down below to donate and to give to our ministries here at Ambassadors Worship Center. Anyway, thank you so much and we'll see you next week.